Welcome to Andrew Womack Recorded Live, a weekly podcast featuring Andrew's latest live teaching sessions, along with his other classic teachings through the years. And now, here's Andrew. Praise the Lord. Man, this is great. Welcome to all of you here. You know, this is a new experience for most people to be talking like the place is full and have three people in here. But this has been my world for 20 years, ministering on television and talking to millions of people that I can't see, but I know you're there. And uh, so anyway, this, this has been a strange time for us. We just had a third year promotion yesterday and we did something similar where we had the class speakers and the directors in here talking live stream to all of the students. And uh, they were either at home or out in their cars watching. And then we had a drive-by graduation where they drove by and we gave them their diploma. And then they drove to another spot and we stood and took pictures with them. And uh, it, was, it was really interesting and it was fun. I think people will remember it. They'll never forget it. So anyway, it's been, it's been different during this time. But uh, as Clay was saying, we're reaching more people, I think, than we've ever reached. I just saw a thing that at the beginning of the praise and worship, we had about 700 people or so uh, watching today. And, I, you know, as it goes along, the numbers will increase. And so uh, we're just excited about all of you who chose to uh, watch this and to be a part of our campus days. Campus days is primarily just to expose Karis and what we do to you to help you make a decision whether or not God is wanting you to come or not. And you know, I think it's already been said today that around here, we don't really say you ought to pray about it. We just tell you to come. It wouldn't hurt anybody, amen. I mean, uh, there's nothing wrong. And I've had people, I've said this a lot at my meetings, but I've had people come up and they're nearly in tears saying, I want to come so badly, but I just don't know if it's God. Would you please pray with me? And, uh, you know, ask if it's God that's wanting me to come to Karis. And I used to try and explain things, but now I've just kind of gotten, I guess, sarcastic, snarky about it. And I say, all right, you know, I, I understand it could be the devil that wants you to come to the Bible college and sit under the word for four hours a day for two or three years. That sounds like the devil or the flesh. Maybe this is just what you want to do in your carnal self is to come and put God first. I can tell you, if you have the desire, one of the reasons that you have the desire is because God put it there. Psalms chapter 37, verse four says, delight yourself in the Lord and he will give you the desires of your heart. And that doesn't mean that God just gives you anything you want because all of us know that there's times that we've wanted things that were not God's will. This is saying that when you delight yourself in the Lord, when you put God first in your life, he puts his desires in your heart. So I'm telling you that if you have a desire to come to Karis Bible College, it didn't come from the devil and it didn't come from the flesh. It comes from God. So really the only question is if you have a desire, if you're interested in it, you just need to make the decision when, how, where do I do it? And I'm going to be talking about some of those things. You know, when I, when you come to Karis Bible College, the very first class or course that I teach is entitled the integrity of the word or a sure foundation. And I just talk about how important the word of God is to your life. And the reason I put this first is because if you waver in this, if you don't understand how important and how powerful, I mean, these are God breathed words. And this is how he literally releases his life through us. Over in 2 Peter chapter 1, uh, verse 3, I believe it is, it says, According as his divine power hath given unto us all things that pertain unto life and godliness through the knowledge of him. All things that pertain unto life and godliness. You know, I've taught on this over an hour. I've actually taught multiple sessions on this one passage of scripture. I'm not going to do that right now. But just think about this. All things that pertain unto life and godliness. That includes healing. If you are seeking God for a mate, if you are having problems in a relationship, if you're wanting a job, if you're trying to figure out the direction of your life or whatever it is, all things 
that pertain unto life and godliness come through the knowledge of him. It didn't say it comes through prayer. It didn't say it comes through fasting. It didn't say it came through being good and trying to do good things. All of those things are good and in their place. They're necessary. But it is the knowledge of God that releases his life into you. What you don't know is literally killing you. You know, there's a statement people say, well, what you don't know won't hurt you. That's absolutely untrue. What you don't know is killing you. You know, we've been dealing with this virus and for the last few months. And um, anyway, I don't know exactly what the end result of all of this is going to be. But, you know, back in the past, I think it was the 1600s, they had a cholera ep- epidemic. And I've done a lot of study about this to draw some conclusions and to make some decisions about things today. And as I've studied this, I remember in England that they literally were having thousands and thousands of people die. And I forget the exact statistics, but I know that during that time, it was somewhere around 90% of the people that got cholera died compared to this virus that we've been dealing with. It's 1% or less, depending on who you're talking to. If you take all of the people that are asymptomatic that don't uh, even show that they've got it. They estimate that it's 1% or less is what President Trump has said. But anyway, my point is something that was much deadlier, they were dealing with this cholera and there was a man in England and there was a, he, what he did was start looking at the people that were dying from cholera and seeing if he could make some uh, judgments from this. And he went to the morgue And he started getting things about where they lived. And did you know that he saw that there were clusters? And there was this one place that thousands of people in this one area had died. And so he went and began to start looking at things. And in the very center of all of this death, there was a well where people went to get their water. And so he made the supposition that it, the water, the cholera somehow or another was associated with that water. At that time, they didn't know what caused it. Now we know what causes it, and cholera is relatively easy to deal with. And so what he did, he went to the uh, officials there in London and convinced them that there was a relationship between this water and cholera. And so he had them remove the pump handle, and they took the pump handle off. People had to go other places. God bless you, Clay. <laughs> and he, they had to go other places to get their water. And did you know what happened? All of a sudden, the death rate in that area just dropped amazingly. So what I'm saying that for you is people say, well, what you don't know doesn't hurt you. What you don't know is killing you. You know, today we can deal with cholera. And in the future, I don't know when it'll be. Someday they will figure out about this virus. They'll come up with some kind of an antidote treatment or a vaccine. And it'll cease to be a problem. And all of the fear and all of the, uh, what I believe is excess and overreaction that we're doing right now is someday will be gone. And then people with that knowledge will look back and say, you know, some of the things we did were really stupid. And really, the point I'm making is what you don't know is killing you. And when it comes to spiritual things, it is absolutely amazing to me how much we don't know about the Lord. One of the typical comments that I get of people that come to my meetings and specifically those that come to Karis Bible College, one of the main comments that we get is people say, I've been in church for 20, 30 years or whatever, and I never knew these things. I have learned more in two years than I have learned in 30 years of being a Christian. Matter of fact, we had one of our directors of the school added up. And if you sit under the word four hours a day for two years, he said it was somewhere equivalent to nearly 20 years worth of church attendance. And plus you're getting it in a condensed form. It's like uh, there's a saturation benefit of just sitting under the word hour after hour. It's like A sponge, if you take a sponge and you just dip it in water once a week, it'll get wet a little bit, but it won't be saturated and it dries out during the week. And then the next week you dip it in the water a little bit and you'll have some water and some softness around the edges. But you know what? If you take that same sponge and just immerse it in the water, it will saturate and literally fill that thing. And this is what Karis does. 
Caris has a lot of benefits to it, but this saturation benefit of where you're just sitting there and being overwhelmed by truth after truth after truth. And the um, speakers that we have, our staff here, are actually the best speakers, I believe, on the planet. I mean, I, I can say that without reservation. God has brought us some of the best people. The majority of people that come to Caris come because I've advertised it on television or they've come to my meeting and they've talked about it. And so they come because they've been touched by the things that the Lord says to, uh, through me. And they come here not knowing what else to expect. But when they get here, I've had many, many, many people get here and say, man, I thought I was coming to hear you, but I love Barry Bennett or Carrie Pickett or, or Greg Moore much more than you. And, and I just think that's awesome. I really do. It doesn't bother me at all. And uh, we have the best staff. Plus, uh, I may be wrong on this, Greg Moore, he will be speaking tonight and he can clarify this and fix it if I'm wrong. But we have over a hundred guest speakers per year. And I mean, they are the best speakers, personal friends, people that are just anointed by God. And I tell you, if you come here, you are going to be overwhelmed by the word of God. So I've said all of those things as way of introduction that, you know what, this is what Karis is all about. It's a Bible college. We've actually had people that have come to our Bible college that have been to cemeteries. I mean, seminaries. And they've been four years, and I've had some of them say that in four years of going to seminary, they never one time studied from the Bible. They studied from books about the Bible. They had all of these extracurricular, uh, you know, uh, sources that they studied. But this is a Bible college. You are going to get Bible teaching. Now, we do bring in other things, especially in our third year courses where we uh, specialize and go into like media and into business and into government and things like that. And so I'm not saying that we discount other sources, but this is a Bible college because the word of God is what's going to change your life. Just as that verse that I started with, 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 3, all things that pertain unto life and godliness come through the knowledge of him. And then the next verse, verse 4 says, whereby are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises that by these we might become partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. The word of God, these promises, the word is what this knowledge comes through. This is the most important thing that the Lord ever gave us outside of Jesus and outside of the leaving us with the power of the Holy Spirit. But as far as revelation of his ways and stuff, the word of God is the key. And as I said, there's so many people that just don't know the word of God and what they don't know is killing them. You know, I'm going to get into some scriptures right here in uh, Matthew chapter 8, if you want to find that and turn over there. But let me just say that during this coronavirus thing, people have been operating in fear. You know, there's a scripture in Hebrews chapter 2, verse 15, that talks about people who all their lifetime were subject to bondage through fear of death. And man, we have seen that graphically displayed. It's, it's true all of the time, but during this pandemic where people have been dying, there have been people and even Christians who are just panicking and don't know what to do. And yet the word of God, and I'm not going to teach on this. I'll just make reference to it. But Psalms chapter 91, and there's just so many other passages of scripture that says that no plague will even come nigh our dwelling. Only with our eyes will we see and behold the reward of the wicked. In other words, uh, it is out there. The curse is out there, but it's not going to affect us. He gives his angels charge over us to bear us up in their hands. We've got all of these promises. Many of you have probably heard these promises before, and you might even be able to quote it. And yet there are still some people that are fearful and say, well, how can I count on this? There are Christians that still, you know, they say that they're believing God and yet they die. Well, the key to this is in Psalms chapter 91, verse 1, where it says you have to dwell under the shadow of the Almighty. It's not where you visit. 
It's not where you go occasionally. It's not where you have a little devotion and for 20 or 30 minutes, you spend time in the presence of God with your mind and heart stayed upon God. But no, this is where you dwell. And then the second verse says that I will say of the Lord, he is my refuge and my fortress. These power, this power of God, the faith of God is voice activated. So see, as you study the word, if you know what Psalms 91 is really saying, I have had zero, I mean zero fear of this. And I have practiced physical distancing and I've done some things. You know, we've complied with the instructions of the leaders around here, really just because I want to be a good citizen and not everybody believes the way that I do. And so I'm trying to get along with them. But I guarantee you, I could go up to anybody. I don't care if they've got the virus and I could hug them. I could kiss them. It's not going to bother me because no plague's going to come by my dwelling. And some of you are thinking, I wish I could believe it. You could if you really understood and knew the power of God. I can give you scriptural examples. Matter of fact, I was telling you to turn to Matthew chapter 8. I want to use this example about the centurion and his servant. But before I get to that, the very first few verses of Matthew chapter 8 is about a leper that came to Jesus. And he said, Lord, if you will, you can make me clean. Now, you know, it was okay for him to say that because they didn't have the revelation that we've got in the New Testament. For, there's many scriptures, but 3 John chapter 1 verse 2 says, Beloved, I wish above all things that you may prosper and be in health even as your soul prospers. There's many, many scriptures. 1 Peter 2, 24, by his stripes we were healed and on and on and on you could go. But that one verse, uh, 3 John chapter 1 verse 2 says he wishes above all things that you prosper and be in health even as your soul prospers. This leper didn't know that verse. That wasn't a revelation under the old covenant. There was healing, but it wasn't revealed as being like the children's bread, as Jesus said, or in Acts chapter 10, verse 38, about how Jesus went about doing good, healing all, not some or a few, but all who were oppressed of the devil for God was with him. It says it was good and they were oppressed of the devil, not of good. So God, so anyway, we could go on and on. This man didn't know those things. So he says, Lord, if you will, you can make me clean. And Jesus responded by saying, I will be thou clean. And then look at this. It says right here in, in uh, chapter eight, this is Matthew chapter eight, verse three. Jesus put forth his hand and touched him saying, I will be thou clean. And immediately his leprosy was cleansed. Did you know that that has application to us today? Again, if you knew the word of God, Jesus put forth his hand and touched a man who had leprosy. Leprosy was highly contagious. And this is even verified over in Leviticus. I believe it's chapter 20 or 22, right around there where it talks about all of the laws concerning leprosy. And it talks about if they touch something that's defiled, it has to be cleansed. If they sit on something, it has to be cleansed. And it, and it was talking about contagious diseases. And yet here's Jesus in a situation where leprosy could be uh, transmitted. And there were actually not only health laws, but there were laws in the old covenant that you could not touch a leper without you becoming unclean. But of course, Jesus broke all of these laws. Gee, it's not that he broke it. He fulfilled it. He superseded them because he was so full of the life of God that instead of sickness coming to him, if he touched something, his healing went to them. The sickness had to flee. You know, I, we had a staff meeting and somebody sent me a picture of a guy who, you know, looked like Jesus the way that we typically uh, envision him. And he was praying for somebody and he had on one of these masks. <laughs> and I guarantee you, there's just something wrong with that picture. When I showed that, people immediately just, no, no, you can't even imagine Jesus practicing physical distancing and wearing a mask and not touching a person. And yet we're supposed to have the mind of Christ. Now, again, I do some things just to be a citizen because, you know, I hadn't got time to tell the average person out here what I'm believing and they don't understand it. And so I'm cooperating to a degree. But I'm saying that we shouldn't be afraid 
and operating in fear. Jesus wasn't that way. Jesus reached out and touched a man with a communicable disease. And instead of the disease coming to him, healing went to them. All of this, see, is in the word of God. And when you begin to get the word, when this word comes alive on the inside of you, it just drives fear away. Often you'll hear things like fear is the opposite of faith. Some people will say fear is the opposite of love. And you can make a case for either one of those things. But you know, you could say that fear is the opposite of peace, trust, reliance upon God. If you really understood this, it just takes fear away. You know, I called my brother. He's four and a half years older than me. And I called him to see how he was doing. And I didn't get him. I got his voicemail. And so he had to call me back. And when he called me back, I said, what were you doing? I thought you were supposed to be staying at home. He said, oh, I was over at my neighbor's house and we were playing games. And I said, boy, you aren't practicing much social distancing. And he says, look, I'm 75 years old. I've had a good life. I know where I'm going. And he says, I'm not afraid to die. He says, I'm not going to change the way I'm living. And he's just out living and enjoying life and stuff. And he doesn't have fear. Again, people through fear of death are subject to bondage. When you understand what the word says, man, heaven is going to be an awesome place. It says in Isaiah that the former things won't even come to mind. We won't even remember all of the hardships and the suffering and the pain that we experienced in this life. It says in Romans chapter 8 that uh, the sufferings of this present world are not even worthy to be compared to the glory which shall be revealed in us. Paul said that I have a longing to depart and to be with Christ, which is far better. And the only reason I'm here is just for you. When you get your mind renewed, again, everything that pertains unto life and godliness comes through the knowledge of him. And when you really start looking at not only, you know, spiritual things, eternal things, heaven and hell things, but when you start looking at the virus, when you start looking at the economic situation, When you start having a paradigm that everything you look through, it's through the word of God. It just changes your reactions. And I'm not saying any of these things to condemn anybody, but there are some people who are watching this today who, if you would be honest, you have panicked, you've had fear, you've wondered, where is this going to go? You're worried about your finances. You're looking at things only from the perspective of the uh, U.S. economy when the Bible clearly says in Philippians 4, 19, that my God shall supply all your need according to his riches in glory by Christ Jesus, not by the U.S. economy. You can prosper even, I don't care what they do. Man, there's so much I'd love to say. I don't know if I'm ever going to get to this scripture. But let me, just, let me just say as way of testimony that you know what? Our ministry, we have 600 plus employees. At one time we had 650. The last I heard it was down around 615. But uh, we have not had to lay off one single person. We didn't take any money from the government. I'm not condemning anybody who does. I'm just saying that we are believing God for our source. We haven't gone down any. We've actually gone up 15% in our income during the coronavirus. And this isn't only true here in the U.S., but we have, I think it's 16 offices around the world, a hundred and something, 150 employees around the world. And did you know that every single office has gone up? They haven't just stayed the same. They've actually increased The point that I'm making is, see, we've been teaching the word of God. The people that go out and start these offices that start all of our schools around the world, they have to go through school first. We don't just uh, embrace somebody else out there. These are people that have our DNA. We've taught them the word of God. The word of God's working in their life. And without exception, the people that are believing the word of God are having their needs supernaturally supplied. And it's across the board. And I've got other friends. I've probably talked to at least a dozen of my minister friends who pastor churches or either have ministries and things like this. And did you know, without exception, the people who have been believing the word and the word of God is now their foundation of how they look at everything, how they operate. They aren't just going by the same fear that the world does. Without exception, every one of them has increased. 
There isn't a one that's gone down. They're all prospering. Now, this may be the first time some of you have ever heard anybody say something like this during this pandemic, but that's because very few people have literally just focused and built their life on the Word of God. But those who have done it are prospering. And I'm telling you, this will work for you. You do not have to be like the world. We are in the world, but we don't have to be like the world. We don't have to be dominated by the same fears. I'm telling you, all of this, the Word of God is what changes. So here in Matthew chapter 8, here's what I was wanting to get to. It says that uh, in verse 5, that when Jesus was entered into Capernaum, there came unto him a certain... Uh, uh, came unto him a centurion beseeching him and saying, Lord, my servant lieth at home sick of the palsy, grievously tormented. And Jesus said unto him, I will come and heal him. The centurion said, Lord, I am not worthy that thou shouldest come under my roof, but speak the word only and my servant shall be healed. For I am a man under authority, having soldiers unto me. And I say to this man, go, and he goeth, and to another come, and he cometh, and to my servant do this, and he doeth it. When Jesus heard it, he marveled and said to them that followed him. Before I get into what he said, did you know there's only twice in Scripture that it's mentioned that Jesus marveled? Once is right here. He marveled at this man's faith, and he wasn't even a Jew. He wasn't what we would call today, you know, in the church. He wasn't a religious person. This was a person that was outside of the Jewish nation. And yet he had a faith that made Jesus marvel. And the second time it says Jesus marveled at his disciples' unbelief. He was amazed that this man who hadn't grown up in church and hadn't had all of the benefits of the Jews could have such a strong faith. And he marveled that people who had been with him for three and a half years and had sat under the teaching and had seen miracles and things that nobody else had ever experienced, he marveled that they could be so full of unbelief. So anyway, something that made Jesus marvel is worth taking notice of. So it says again here in Matthew chapter 8 and in verse 10, when Jesus heard it, he marveled and said unto him, Unto them that followed him, verily I say unto you, I have not found so great faith, no, not in Israel. And I say unto you that many shall come from the east and the west and shall sit down with Abraham and with Isaac and with Jacob in the kingdom of heaven. But the children of the kingdom shall be cast out into outer darkness. There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. And Jesus said unto the centurion, go thy way and as thou hast believed, so be it done unto thee. And his servant was healed in the selfsame hour. Jesus didn't have to go touch him. When this man's faith was so strong that his faith was in the word, the spoken word. God, you just give me a word. You give me a promise. And that's enough for me. I don't have to physically have you come to my house. I don't have to have you touch him. I don't have to have you wave your hand over him. Now, let me make some points here that Jesus did go. He was going to go to this man's house and pray for him. Jesus did accommodate people who needed a touch. The fifth chapter of the book of Mark is where a woman said, if I can only touch the hem of his garment, I shall be whole. That's where her faith was. That was her point of contact. God used it. I'm not saying it's wrong, but I'm saying that it is at a whole nother level When you get to the place that, God, I don't need something physical, you speak the word only. You know, this is one thing that I think that's good that's coming out of this two-month shelter-at-home situation that we've gone through. And that is that so much of what we do, we're drawing on the energy, on the faith, the collective energy. you know, faith of people and you get into an environment of faith where, man, everybody's shouting and praising God. And I tell you what, it'll, it'll, you know, put a shout in a corpse and you get into situations like that. You draw off the faith of other people. And I'm not saying that that's wrong, but one good thing that's come out of this is that we've had to sit down and talk to other people through a computer. And we've had to, uh, increase our relationship with God personally. We don't have all of these other things. Just like Daniel was saying during the praise and worship 
a few minutes ago that when we all get back together and we aren't doing this just by faith, seeing the hundreds of you that are watching, but when we can sit here and see your face and see people's lives that are being changed, man, that's encouraging. And I'm not discouraging that. The scripture says, don't forsake the assembling of yourselves together. So that's good. And we need to do it. But I think one good thing that's come out of this is that a lot of people who have been dependent too much upon the corporate anointing and have been dependent too much upon other people and they haven't had the personal contact with the Lord, personal relationship, they can't get alone with the Lord and just enjoy his presence. I think that this has highlighted some of those deficiencies. And I think that there's some people that realized, you know what, I'm kind of living off the faith of other people when it comes to just me and the Lord. Like I've had some people say something about they're lonely. Man, I can't even relate to that. I can't, I can't understand a person being lonely. When you have the Lord who said he'll never leave you nor forsake you and he loves you. You know, we were singing this morning about I've never had a friend like Jesus. Jesus sticks closer than a brother. Jesus is more real to me than my wife. He's more real to me than physical things that I see. And if, if you're one of those that's been lonely and if you have been discouraged in fighting depression, I'm not saying this in condemnation, but it's because you are so dependent upon physical things. And again, God uses that. God uses corporate anointing. God uses going and touching a person. And you can sometimes even feel the virtue flowing out of a person. I'm not saying that those things are sinful or wrong, but I'm saying that there is a step that's even above that. And that's what Jesus is saying, that this is the greatest faith I've ever encountered a man who said, I don't need to see you. I don't have to have you touch my servant. You speak the word only. And Jesus said, this is the greatest faith I've ever seen. A person who believes the word and not all of these other things. You know, we got a beautiful building here. God has blessed us. Clay was talking about and, and Matt and Candace, you know, showed you a little bit about Woodland Park, and it's a beautiful surrounding. And I believe that enhances and adds to it. I'm not saying that, man, I'm, I praise God that the Lord didn't have me build all of this in the desert someplace. Amen. <laughs> I enjoy where we are. I love it. I, it's an added benefit. But did you know the word is the important thing? And we could be meeting in, in a place that wasn't nice. And if the word was going forth, that's the important thing. Now, praise God that we have beautiful surroundings and nice buildings, but it's the word. And I think that this is one of the good things that could come out of this is that we readjust our focus and fine tune it to where God, it's your word. And whether it comes through a person with a silver voice and fancy dress and all of the trappings and all of the things or not, it's the word that changes people. You know, another comment that I get a lot is people say that they saw me on television for years and they would pass by because I wasn't screaming, I wasn't shouting, I wasn't standing up and sweating, I didn't have a handkerchief wiping my fevered brow, I, I wasn't saying glory to God, duh. And because of this, they would pass by my program thinking this guy can't be anointed. And then one lady, I remember her testifying that she passed me by for years. And one day she was shelling peas and she had her lap. She was wearing an apron and stuff. And she had her lap full of peas and the remote was too far away. She couldn't turn it when I came up. <laughs> and so out of nothing but just laziness, she decided, well, I'll listen. And when she heard the word, she said it changed her life. And now she loves it. So anyway, my point is, see, that there's a lot of people that will reject the things that God says through me because I don't have the trappings, the religious uh, trappings that other people are used to and stuff. But then once they listen, it's the word. It should be the word. And to me, and again, I know that this is a personal preference type of thing, but to me, it distracts me when I see people doing all of this other stuff and the smoke and the mirrors and the flashing lights and the strobe lights and the smoke. We do that for musicals, but I have just put my foot down. I am not into all of the smoke and the mirrors and the other stuff. To me, it's the word. And these other things distract from me. It draws my attention away from the Lord. 
And so and again, again, a lot of that's personal preference, but I'm just saying it's the word that it, that should be exalted. And yet so many other people are exalting these other things. Let me share with you John chapter 20. And I want to contrast the faith that this centurion operated in with the unbelief that one of Jesus' disciples operated in. So in John chapter 20, this is after his resurrection. And on the resurrection day, he appeared in Jerusalem to his disciples as they were meeting together. And they had all of the doors and the windows locked because they were fearful of being found out by the Jews. And while in in this situation where there was no way to enter this room, all of a sudden Jesus just shows up and he appeared to his disciples and they were shocked and they actually doubted that it was him. And so he says, he says, look at my hands and look at my feet. It's me. A spirit doesn't have flesh and bone the way that you see me have. So they went out and they told Thomas. Thomas was one of the 12 disciples, but he wasn't with them this first time that Jesus appeared. And they told Thomas, what had happened and Thomas said, I'm not going to believe that he's raised from the dead unless I can put my finger into the print of the nails and thrust my hand into his side. I will not believe. That's verse 25. Notice he said, I will not believe. Unbelief is a choice. Faith is a choice. You have to choose. If you're waiting until facts are just so conclusive and overwhelming that there's no faith involved, you'll never believe. You have to choose to believe. And likewise, you have to choose to disbelieve. You know, I've seen my son raised from the dead. I've seen my wife raised from the dead. We saw a little baby raised from the dead in this exact spot last August, raised from the dead. And if I say this and some of you think, well, I'm not sure about that. You're the one who chose not to believe. It's a choice. I'm giving you information. The word of God says that the same works that Jesus did, we will do also. There are things that say that God is still alive and well and moving. And if you struggle to believe, it's because you chose that. You may not have chosen it in the sense that God, I just want to disbelieve you, but you chose to hold to the way you've been taught, to the doctrines and the things that make the word of God of none effect. So over here in the 20th chapter, he says, I will not believe. And then in verse 26, it says, after eight days, again, his disciples were within and Thomas was with them. Then came Jesus, the doors being shut and stood in the midst and said, peace be unto you. Then said he unto Thomas, reach hither thy finger and behold my hands and reach hither thy hand and thrust it into my side and be not faithless, but believing. Did you know that Jesus just appeared all of a sudden and he walked right over to Thomas and says, put your finger into the print of the nails. Nobody had told him this. Again, this was another confirmation that this was Jesus, the resurrected Jesus, because he knew everything that had transpired, everything that Thomas had said. And so he told him, he says, all right, touch me. Put your finger into the print of the nails and find out that it's me. He was going to accommodate his, his faith was at the level that I have to see. I have to touch before I'll believe. And he was going to accommodate him. But look what happened. It says, Thomas answered and said unto him, my Lord and my God. It doesn't mention that he ever touched him. Once he knew that this was Jesus, once he saw him, once he knew that he had already heard what he had said and expressed his doubts, He fell down and confessed he was his Lord and God. And then in verse 29, Jesus said unto him, Thomas, because thou hast seen me, thou hast believed. Blessed are they that have not seen and yet have believed. Man, this is awesome. You know, the Lord revealed this back to me back in the very beginning of my walk with the Lord. I got born again when I was eight, but when I was 18, I had this miraculous encounter with the Lord, a an emotional encounter. It was physical. It was spiritual. The other people that were there, they didn't feel a thing. But man, I felt some. God changed my life. And for four and a half months, I was caught up in the presence of God. But did you know it, even though it, it proved to me that God was more real than anything else, And I loved it and I experienced the presence of God. It nearly destroyed me because I became addicted 
to that feeling, to that emotion. I could spend an hour trying to explain this to people, but I mean, it was tangible. I, if, it's like if I closed my eyes, there was times that I was literally afraid to open my eyes because Jesus' presence was so real. I was afraid I'd see him. And the scripture says, you can't see God and live. And I was honestly afraid to open my eyes at times. There was times that God's presence was just overwhelming. And it was wonderful, but it nearly destroyed me because I thought I can't live without this emotion. And I got to seeking after four and a half months that feeling, the emotion of it left. And I could give reasons why all of this happened. But uh, then I became desperate. Like, what do I do to get it back? I didn't know what I did to have this experience with the Lord. I didn't know what I did to lose it. And I didn't know what I needed to do to get it back. And panic began to set in. And one of the best things that ever happened to me was I got drafted and sent to Vietnam. And in Vietnam, I was forced because there was so much ungodliness. There were so many opportunities to walk away from God that I was, I mean, it was impossible to be indifferent. I was either going to go in the wrong direction or I was going to have to get close to God. And out, out of desperation, prior to that time, I was just seeking the Lord and I would spend days fasting and praying and asking God for an emotional experience. In Vietnam, I was sitting on top of a mountain for 13 months in a bunker that I built. And I just would sit there and for anywhere from 10 to 15 hours a day, I just read. I just read the Bible because there was nothing else to do. I had nothing else to do. I was a chaplain's assistant and I only had a chaplain for just a few months. And the rest of the time I was on this fire support base without a chaplain. And I was assigned to the chaplaincy, which was the uh, brigade headquarters. I was out on a battalion level. So actually nobody there on that hill was my boss. I didn't answer to anybody. I was just stuck there for 13 months sitting there doing nothing. And I just would start reading out of desperation. And here's my point is that through the word, God began to reveal himself to me. God began to show me things. I began to understand and going back to the very first passage of scripture that I used, 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 3, all things that pertain unto life and godliness come through the knowledge of him that has called us to glory and virtue. And through the knowledge of the word, the things that the, these exceeding great and precious promises that the word was imparting to me, I began to have back joy and peace. But this time it wasn't emotional. I don't know how to describe this properly because it was emotional. I was happy. I was blessed, but it wasn't, it wasn't a physical happiness and peace and joy that was dependent upon everything being right. I was in Vietnam. I was being shot at. <laughs> Did you know on my 21st birthday, we had 21 mortars hit my bunker. It was like, I thought they, they know it's my birthday. Amen. I, celebration. And I had 21 mortars hit my bunker and you go out and you have to go to the latrine and you got to do it. You got to do your business quickly because man, they'll shoot you. And uh, it was tough. And you know what? It wasn't based on my circ My circumstances weren't what was making me happy. I was finding who I was in Christ. I was finding my life through the word of God. My faith was transitioning from a physical experience into an experience that was based on the Word of God. And these verses that I'm sharing with you, these are some of the things that God showed me right then. And I mean, it transformed my life. I actually, after I had this encounter with the Lord, I started being exposed to people like uh, Kenneth Hagin and other people that, you know, I was raised a Baptist and these people were way out side of my realm of normal, but I was just seeking God. And I began to start hearing about people who talked about encounters where they saw the Lord. God spoke to him in an audible voice. Kenneth Hagin would talk about fire in his hands, jumping from his hands when he put them on a person and things. And I began to hear about things like this that I'd never 
I, I didn't know things like that happened today. But once I started reading about it, man, I said, those things are real. And I started fasting and praying and asking God for those kind of experiences. And I remember one night in Vietnam that, man, I was just so intent on having God once again appear to me and do something physical that I stayed up all night long praying. And I mean, I, I don't know how to describe it. I don't, I don't have the words, but it was like I was in a trance or something and I didn't know what was going on. I wasn't asleep. I was awake. And in, and in the morning when I finally came to myself, I must have had, I don't know, hundreds of cockroaches just all over me. They were just crawling all over me and I had red marks where they had been biting me and I was just out of it. I was seeking God. I was looking for something tangible and it wasn't happening. And out of desperation, I started getting into the Word. And God showed me these verses. And when I saw that the greater blessing, there's actually a greater blessing on those who have not seen and yet have believed. There's a greater anointing when you're operating in faith based on the Word of God than when you're operating in feeling. When I saw this, I remember telling the Lord, Father, if this is true, and I meditated on it for a while until I knew it was true. I said, I never want to have any supernatural experience ever. Now, I've never said I'll turn it down. I'm not, I'm not saying I'll re rejected if God wants to talk to me in an audible voice or to show me something physical. But I came to this conclusion that God, I don't, I don't care if I ever have anything that touches me emotionally or something, I'm going to stand on your word. I want to be like the centurion that operates in a faith that even makes you marvel that all you got to do is just take the word of God. And I made that decision. And did you know, it was like uh, I flipped a switch in my life and I started walking by faith and not by feeling. I am not saying that faith is void of feeling, but faith isn't depending on feeling. Feelings are like a byproduct. It's the caboose. It's not the engine. And there are times, I don't say these things very often because people would misunderstand it and get the wrong impression, but there are times that literally I have such anointing come on me and I can feel the power of God flow through me. But I don't often say that because people will get to putting their faith in the fact that, well, Andrew felt this instead of the word of God. And I don't think that that's what God wants me to do. So I don't tell people. There's times that honestly, I've had some awesome supernatural experiences and God has done things, but I don't tell people about that much because to me, that's just a byproduct. If I do what God tells me to do, and if I feel joy, if I feel an anointing, if I feel a goosebump running up and down my spine, I may say, thank you, Jesus, but it's not going to change what I do. I'm not going to all of a sudden say, now I know it's true because I felt it. No, I believe it whether I feel it or not. And actually I've gotten to a place, I've thought of this many times, but you know, the greatest miracles that I've ever seen, I felt nothing. And there is a tendency that when I am feeling the presence of God and I'm feeling his anointing, which again, there's nothing wrong with that. But when I, if I ever move my faith from what God's word says over to the fact that, oh, I feel the presence of God, that's dangerous. And I've actually, there's been times that in services, the manifest presence of God was so real 
that everybody could feel it. And did you know that I have a tendency in those situations to get into the flesh and because I'm feeling it all of a sudden, now I'm doing things. The greatest miracles I've ever seen are when I felt nothing and I just had a word from God. God spoke something to me in my heart and I just stood on what the word said. Beyond any shadow of a doubt. I mean, when my son, matter of fact, when my son died, we got a phone call March the 4th, 2001, I believe it was, uh, 4.15 in the morning. And my oldest son told me that my youngest son had died. He had been dead for nearly five hours, between four and five hours at that time. And Jamie and I had to get up and drive about 40 something miles into Colorado Springs. And we didn't have cell phones. We didn't know what had happened. And as we were driving right by this property that we have now, it was halfway in between my house and Colorado Springs. And as we were driving by this property, God brought back to my remembrance prophecies and then scriptures about you war, good warfare through the uh, prophecies that were given unto you and other things. And, and a number of things happened. And all of a sudden, I just by faith began, I knew that for those words to come to pass, he had to be raised from the dead. And I started praising God. But when I first started believing, there was zero feeling. Matter of fact, I was feeling grief and sorrow because my son was dead. I was feeling the same things that anybody else would feel. And if I would have fallen into this thing that for me to really feel like I'm in faith, I've got to have some tingling, some anointing, some physical, emotional response. I can guarantee you my son would be dead and I wouldn't have a granddaughter that just turned 18 years old. I wouldn't have had that if I'd have gone anything by my feeling. I have learned that the highest form of faith is just to take the word of God and stand on the word of God regardless of what you feel like, regardless of what circumstances look like. And it's my testimony that I believe compares perfectly with the scriptures I used in Matthew chapter 8 and John chapter 20, that this is the highest form of faith. It gets the best results. And I've said all of these things today to say to you that if you're watching this, if you are considering coming to Karis Bible College, I suspect that that's because you already know the Lord. You are born again. You have a desire. You know that God's got more for you than what you're experiencing. And you're just looking and saying, is it possible that God would want me to come to Bible college? And you're looking about how do I get from where I am to where I'm supposed to go? I'm telling you the way to do it is to exalt the word of God, to start basing your life on the truth of God's word and not just feelings. Again, when I first had this experience with the Lord in 1968, I was desperate to get that feeling back. And I started reading books about revival. I read books about people that had all of these experiences. And I mean, I was just begging and pleading with the Lord. I, I started all night prayer meetings that never went past one or two in the morning, but they were supposed to be all night prayer meetings. And we would just sit there and beg God for revival and beg for him to pour out his his spirit. Why? Because we didn't feel it. We weren't seeing it. But did you know, as I've grown in the word, I now realize that God has done everything for me that he's going to do. In my spirit, I, as in, I am as complete right this moment as I will ever be in eternity. I don't need more of God. I don't need joy. I don't need peace. I don't need all of these things. In my spirit, I am complete. Colossians chapter 2, verses 9 and 10. You are complete in Him. I
got the fullness of the Godhead dwelling in me bodily. Now that doesn't deny that I also have a soul and I have a body. And there are times that I don't feel the presence of God. There's times that I don't feel joy. There's times that I don't feel all of these things. There's times that my body is experiencing sickness, which is completely contrary to the health that I have in my spirit. I don't deny that I have those things, but now that I've exalted the word of God and know who I am in Christ, when I don't feel the presence of God, I know why I don't feel him. It's because my mind isn't stayed upon him. Isaiah 26, three, the Lord will keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed upon him because he trusts in him. So I know why I'm not feeling the joy and the peace and why I'm not seeing the healing in things. And instead of going to God and asking him to give me something that his word says I already have, I instead base my life on what God says I have, what God says I can do, and I start drawing out of me what God has already given me at salvation instead of begging God to give me something that I've already got. You know, I've used this illustration a lot, but if, we, if you were here physically, I'll often walk down and I'll give my Bible to somebody on the front row. And then I'll say, now, what would I do if this person says, Andrew, could I have your Bible? Could I look up a scripture? Could you please give me your Bible? If a person is asking me to give them something that I've already given them, how do you respond? I'd probably not say anything. I'd probably just look at you like, you aren't all there. Your elevator doesn't go to the top floor. Something's wrong with you. you. You're asking for something that I've already given you. What do you want me to do that I haven't done? I'd probably just be silent, similar to the way that most people, when they're praying and asking God to heal them, oh God, pour out your spirit. Oh God, show me that you love me. Oh God, do all you don't hear anything. It's because God has already done it. He's already put these things on the inside of you. Galatians 5, 22 and 23, you've got love, joy, peace, long suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. Against such there is no law. Those things are already there. And somebody says, but I don't feel it. That's because you're trying to feel it in some physical, emotional way when the truth is in the spirit realm, it's a done deal. And you just have to draw it out. You have to, again, it's like I said at the very beginning of this, faith is voice activated. You have to begin to speak what God says about you. You have to draw these things out. You have to start acting in agreement. Faith without works is dead, James chapter two. So if you're sitting here asking for love and joy, but then you're saying, well, I don't feel it. And I'm not sure that God loves me. And you're acting in fear. You're, you're voiding these things, but in the spirit, you've already got it. See, you need to come to school. You need to learn these things. And I tell you, it's been a progression for me and I'm still learning it. I hadn't arrived, but praise God, I've left. I tell you what, I'm a lot closer to walking in this than I've ever been in the past. And if you come to Karis Bible College, the things that God has done in my life, I can guarantee you, we're gonna transmit those things to you. And the things that you've done in all of our other instructors, this is one of the great things about Karis Bible College. It just, it's amazing to me. You know, I, I am thrilled with what God has done in my life. I feel honored that God would have picked me. If I was God, I don't think I would have picked me. I am honored. I am not discrediting what God has done in my life any at all, but I am not the full manifestation of Jesus. There's other people that have giftings and talents that I don't have. And one of the things that I love about Karis is that together we are making an impact that I could never make on my own. And when you come, you are going to get, I, I think uh, Greg Moore down here, he's going to be ministering tonight. I think it was Greg that figured out if you added up just our paid staff, the people that are on staff here, if you added up our number of years in ministry, wasn't it over a thousand years? paid staff and adjunct faculty over a thousand years of walking with the Lord. Think of what that would do. You don't have to go out and learn all of these things by hard knocks. You don't, ha you know, I've been walking with the Lord since that experience in 1968. I've been walking with the Lord now for 52 years, seeking him, 
with my whole heart. He's done so many great things in my life. You don't have to wait 52 years. You can learn it at my expense. You can learn it at the expense of all of these other people. Greg Moore, he's been pastoring for what, 120, 30 years. I mean, this man, it's just awesome what he's got. And Carrie Pickett over here, man, she spent 16 years on a mission field. A single woman went over to Russia by herself, didn't know the language, didn't have anything. And he's just a walking, living miracle. And Barry Bennett, he'll be speaking this morning. Barry went to Chile with his family and, I mean, just struck out probably with more faith than wisdom and stuff. And he's learned some things. And man, he can tell you some things. And you are going to benefit at our expense. You don't have to learn all of this on your own. I'm telling you, Karis is a God idea. We've now, I don't even know the exact number, but it's thousands. I think it's around 8,000 graduates that we've had. And we have somewhere around six to 7,000 people right now in our system worldwide, uh, either on site or going through correspondence. And we are seeing lives changed on a mass scale. And this is just a discipleship making machine. And this is what God's raised us up to do. And so I'm really glad that you've joined us for Karis Days and to get a little taste of things. We wished you could be here so that you could see the facilities because it just enhances the... the experience. We've got, we got a uh, mezzanine upstairs and then downstairs out here with the most beautiful view of Pikes Peak. And I mean, you, you can put over a thousand people out there just in the break area. And we have great things happening and it just enhances the experience. But the point I'm trying to get across is that despite all the buildings, the surroundings, the people and everything else, it's the word that's going to change your life. And I'll tell you this, that if, if you did nothing but just do what I did and shut yourself up for 10 to 15 hours a day, not everybody can do that because not everybody's been drafted and sent to Vietnam, amen. Some of you have to uh, make a living. You got a family and not everybody can do that. But if you did what I did and just studied for 10 or 15 hours a day for a year and then after that spend up to six or seven hours a day for 10 years or something, you know what? You could learn these things on your own, but praise God, there's a better way. And that's Karis Bible College. You can come and get in a condensed form the things that it took me years and years and years of studying. The same thing with every one of our other instructors. We're taking our entire life lessons and we're condensing them into just bite-sized pieces so that you can, you can get experience in just a very short period of time, things that it's taken us decades to learn. Plus, you can learn by our mistakes. And you know, I, I'm very candid about the mistakes that I've made. I think every one of our instructors are, none of us here are presenting ourselves as we've got it all figured out and we've done everything perfectly. I've already said during this thing, if I was God, I wouldn't have chosen me. I got plenty of problems and stuff. And you can learn by what we've done wrong, by the mistakes that we've made. There is just no reason that you can have, that you have to have this feeling on the inside that God, I know there's more, but I don't know how to get it. In this sense of desperation where you're just begging and pleading for God to do something. I'm telling you, God has done his part. You have everything that you need to be a 100% success. The only thing you're lacking 
are these exceeding great and precious promises, the knowledge of it, the revelation of it. Once you know the truth, man, the truth will set you free. And that's what this is all about. So I'm appealing to you, even though you aren't here physically to see the physical things and to be around all of the people and to experience the love and the joy and the peace and things like that. I'm telling you the most important thing is this is a Bible college. It's the word of God that's going to change your life. That's what's changed my life. That's what's changed all of our lives. And that's what will change your life. If what I'm saying is true, and I've got thousands of people to prove that it's true, we've seen the change. Then why in the world wouldn't you do this? Why would you let anything get in the way? This is the most important thing for your spiritual growth that you could possibly do. So I'm encouraging you to uh, really soak it in. We're going to expose you to some of the teachers. Carrie Pickett's going to be ministering in a few minutes, and then Barry Bennett tonight. Greg Moore, the director of our Karis campus here. And you're going to get to hear these people and to see their hearts. And I tell you what, you need to be a part of this. Also, just for your information, I am ministering in healing school this afternoon. That's at one o'clock mountain time. And uh, that's so if you want to tune into that, we will be having that live streamed also. But let me pray with you right now. And if God is speaking to your heart, Do something about it. And don't wait until, well, I'm going to do something next week, next month, because if the Lord has spoken to you right now, Satan comes immediately to steal away that word. And as you get back into listening to all of the fear about the coronavirus, and as you get to talking about all of the impossibilities and when are they going to lift this, all that stuff will just confuse and, and it'll hinder. If God is speaking to you right now, you need to do something right now. I'm sure that we have some way that you could go online right now. That's not my expertise, but Clay will come back up and explain these things to you. You could do something right now. You could put down a deposit, start putting some motion in this direction and God will do a miracle for you. So Father, I pray for all of the people who are watching this today. I believe that you brought them here. I believe it's because they know that there's more in their heart. They're looking and questioning if Karis could be a part of that. And Father, I'm just praying that the Holy Spirit would take the things that I've said here today and that you would use this to touch people's lives. And for those that you want to come here and to be a part of this, this is your plan to get their life moving in the right direction. Father, I pray that you'd speak to them right now and make it so clear to them that they would just know it in their heart that, Father, they would act on it. Regardless of the other things that have to work out, finances, family, housing, jobs, Father, I pray that they would just exalt the Word, that, Father, they would go by what you're speaking to them right now and not let circumstances steal these things from them. So, Father, I just believe that the Holy Spirit is touching their hearts right now, that people in their hearts are saying yes And then they'll make this decision and they'll begin to do something. Faith without works is dead. Father, I thank you. And we welcome them into the Karis family. Believe that, Father, this is going to be a life-changing experience for them. We thank you for that and receive it in the name of Jesus. Amen. So, Clay, can I turn it back over to you? You probably have some announcements, but also let them know. For more of Andrew's teaching and other resources, please visit our website at awmi.net. Or for prayer and additional information, call our helpline at 719-635-1111. Again, that's 719-635-1111.